making sense of heat waves. We're actually nudging in, in the European continent, we're now nudging towards 50 degrees. So I think, yes, we will see 50 degrees Celsius. And music out of storm data. We created events through the winter of the calmer days and the calmer weeks, and you can hear the change of pace through the pieces as more storminess events occur later in the 21st century. It's Friday the 1st of July, and you're listening to Weathersnap from the Met Office. Hello, I'm Claire Nazir. Welcome to Weathersnap, an insider's guide to the week's weather headlines. This week, Japan hit the weather headlines as extreme heat brought an early end to seasonal rains. June is typically the wettest month of the year in Japan. However, the Japanese Meteorological Agency declared an official end to the rainy season 22 days early. That makes it the shortest since records began in 1951. Global heat waves have rarely been out of the news these last few months and each event is closely scrutinised by scientists. A new Met Office study released this week suggests record-breaking June temperatures across Western Europe are now 10 times more likely than 20 years ago. Here, climate correspondent Graham Madge talks to Met Office heatwave expert Professor Peter Stott. His team compared heatwaves earlier this month with the infamous events of 2003, when Europe endured a series of extreme heat events. Our findings were that such a heat wave, such intense temperatures that we've seen in Western Europe this month, in June, are made very much more likely as a result of climate change, as a result of emissions of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And it's a really striking conclusion because we've really shown how substantial is the contribution of human activities on the likelihood of getting such very extreme temperatures so early in the summer. As a scientist, you must feel delighted that your research from 20 years ago is being vindicated. But you must also be alarmed at the rate at which climate change impacts are happening across Europe. Did you think back then that this could actually happen now? We did think that this could happen now, although we did hope back then that we would have already started to turn the trajectory away from the predictions we made back then. So. Yes, delighted that our research has been vindicated, but very much alarmed. But this new analysis shows that it's actually happening. How does this recent heat wave in southwest Europe compare with the major events in 2003? Well, I remember the 2003 summer very well because I was actually on holiday in Italy in the real extreme part of that heat wave when there was 40 degrees Celsius. And that was during August of 2003. And it's actually what prompted me to make the analysis was the realisation that this heat wave was so widespread in 2003 and so long-lasting and so extreme and very sadly we saw many many thousands of people particularly elderly vulnerable people dying in that heat wave and I think there was a big lesson that was learned about how much better we we need to cope with such extremes. So the current heat wave of course so far we're only a third of the way through the three summer months so far um, and it remains to be seen how the rest of the summer goes through July and August. But I think what's particularly alarming about this summer is how early we're seeing the heat records. So, for example, in France, we've seen the earliest ever 40 degrees Celsius on record, the earliest in the summer season. Because of our more Atlantic-dominated conditions, we haven't quite seen the temperature extremes of the continent. Is it fair to say that the warming trend in the UK could be less than more southerly parts of Europe? It is the case, to some extent, that we're a little bit moderated by the effects of the Atlantic Ocean. And it's in the, particularly the Mediterranean region where there is the, the drying which contributes to the heat, particularly in the summer. However, we should not forget that nevertheless in the UK we are sharing in this general warming pattern, which is still substantial. And also we need to remember that we get these particular spikes of heat when we share in these heat waves from further south in Europe, which is exactly what we've seen earlier this year. We saw a brief excursion of, of extreme temperatures. At the moment, we're seeing very high temperatures in the Scandinavian Arctic, temperatures above 30 degrees C. We're also seeing very high temperatures in Japan. How frequent is it that you get multiple hot spell or heat wave events happening at the same time across the Northern Hemisphere? Well, this is actually one of the really striking things that, that I've noticed just in the last few summers in the Northern Hemisphere is this, is now we're every single summer we're talking about heat waves happening across the hemisphere. 
in the summer. And we're talking about record-breaking temperatures. We're talking about exceeding these sorts of thresholds that we've talked about, 50 degrees or 40 degrees further north or 30 degrees in June above the Arctic Circle, which we've not seen before. And this was not the case 10 or 20 years ago. Looking at the future, how much more extreme do you think European heat waves can become? Could we be looking, for example, at the prospect of 50 degrees C heat waves being recorded in Europe in the near future? Well, we saw almost 49 degrees Celsius in Syracuse in Italy last summer. So we're actually nudging in, in the European continent, we're now nudging towards 50 degrees. So I think, yes, we will see 50 degrees Celsius uh, in the coming summers. Why should we care about that in the UK? The really important thing here is that our societies have not adapted. In Southern Europe, in the Mediterranean region, of course, they are used to hotter temperatures than we are in the UK, for example. But there, they're not used to 50 degrees Celsius and all that brings with it. And particularly protecting elderly and vulnerable populations because of their infrastructure, because of their buildings. If you think about the UK, we're even less adapted to extreme heat. And therefore, for us, 40 degrees Celsius, as we've seen in previous summers, is a, is a real threat that we need to be prepared for. Professor Peter Stott. The Outer Hebrides is a series of islands off the west coast of Scotland. From travel to making a living, weather shapes the lives of all of its inhabitants, with winter storms having a particularly profound influence. Recently, a novel project brought together residents, musicians and Met Office scientists in an attempt to demonstrate the close relationship between climate and people. Here's James Pope. My name is James Pope. And I'm a climate scientist working with the United Kingdom Climate Projections, UKCP, focusing on future changes in the climate of the United Kingdom through the 21st century. Having determined how there were possible changes in storminess into the future, I was then able to work with a local artist, Sandra Kennedy. Sandra took our UK Climate Projections model data, simulated for the 21st century, and ran it through a program called Two Tone to generate music. What we did was we created events through the winter of the calmer days and the calmer weeks and then the stormier days and stormier weeks. And this gives a natural rise and fall. And you can hear the change of pace through the pieces as more storminess events occur later in the 21st century. Sandra then interviewed members of the local community and interspersed them on the music we created from the climate data. He came over um, in, you know, chest deep in uh, water um, over a causeway and a uh, bridge and stuff. Um, and there was like slates, you know, being fired into the ground, like, you know, shards. Um, we were very keen to make sure that we were able to include everybody across the island. And therefore, it was vital that we had spoke to people in both English and Gaelic. The Outer Hebrides sit on the western coast of Scotland, out into the Atlantic. In the future, we can expect more winter storm events um, areas like the Outer Hebrides are particularly exposed to these storm events. Future changes in the storminess will play a big impact on the community, their resilience, but also on a number of industries as well. There's a huge amount of storm surge came up once uh, the tides had come up. Uh, when I come onto spring tides, it was just something I'd never seen before in the loch here. While the pieces we've created here are bespoke for the Outer Hebrides and will continue to be used across the Outer Hebrides, the methodology and the understanding we have gained from this project we're hoping to use to explore the potential to develop these storylines across uh, the rest of the United Kingdom. Well, showers have dominating conditions for the last week or so in June. What can we expect next as we move into July? Here with the outlook, Alex Deacon. 
The weather remains pretty mixed through this weekend. I think we'll all see a bit of blue sky, but a sunshine at some point. But most of us will also see some rain. Saturday sees an air of low pressure dominating and a weather front moving slowly but surely from west to east. It may not arrive across East Anglia in the southeast though until quite late in the day. So for most places here, much of Saturday, dry and bright and quite warm actually, 23, maybe even 24 Celsius. Elsewhere though, temperatures are only going to be in the high teens and there will be initially a band of rain crossing England and Wales and that's then followed by showers, heavy showers across Scotland, Northern Ireland and northwest England. Not too many for Wales and the southwest where things may well brighten up come Saturday afternoon. Sunday, again, a mix of sunshine and showers for most places, but with high pressure building up from the Azores, the Azores High, that does mean South Wales, South West England will probably stay dry and fine. Elsewhere, expect some showers and the, again be on the heavy side, particularly over parts of the east come the afternoon. A bit more of a breeze blowing on Sunday and again, temperatures for most places below the average for early July, only getting into the high teens. There are some signs that the Azores high will start to dominate slowly but surely as we go through next week. So things turning a little drier and a little sunnier and perhaps a little bit warmer next week. Thanks, Alex. Just before we go, here's Martin Bowles with last week's highs and lows. Here are the UK weather extremes for the week beginning on Monday the 20th of June and ending on Sunday the 26th of June. The highest recorded air temperature of the week was 28.2 degrees Celsius at Harden Airport in Clwyd. The coldest place was Kinbrae's Hatchery in the far north of Scotland, where 0.1 Celsius was measured early on Monday morning. The largest rainfall totals were in Northern Ireland at the end of the week. 34.2 mm was measured at Killy Lane in County Antrim in the 24 hours of Sunday. Tuesday was the summer solstice the longest day of the year, so you would expect long sunshine hours. The biggest total was actually on Thursday. 16.3 hours was measured at Dice Airport near Aberdeen. Thanks, Martin. That's it for Weathersnap. I'm Claire Nazir. Editor is Adrian Holloway. Weathersnap is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office weather app.